Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for family, for your peace and in, in that prayer prayer works, Lord, in that the covering of your wings reaches over the miles. And we just give this time and this word to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is, the sermon's coming out of, I went to uh, a friend's, um, he was preaching, and one of my pet peeves is not going into a church, but, so I was, I went to, to support a friend who was preaching, and uh, was very much excited to, to hear what he had to say, and he was preaching out of John four forty six through 54, and just as I was listening to him, you know, I read, I read the passage, and, and, and we'll, we'll get to that passage, but a question popped into my mind as I'm reading this, and it said, how far will my faith go? How far can my faith travel? You know, and so I started looking at things, you know, because that challenged me. It's, it's, and so I started looking at distance healings in the Bible. And it just so happened, at least, that I found there were three instances. So we're, I'll give you these three and their passages because I'm feeling generous tonight. So there's the story of the centurion healing that cover, that's covered in Matthew 8, 5 through 13, and Luke 7, 1 through 10. And then I have the Gentile woman, which is Matthew 15, 21 through 28, and Mark 7, 24 through 30. And then I have the nobleman, that was John 4, 46 through 54. So I looked at each of these, and these, from, from what I was able to search and, and research, these are the only distance healings recorded in the Word. You know, and, and they run the gamut of, you know, a son, um, a daughter possessed, a son, you know, sick, and a servant needing healing. And, and so I just kind of looked at it, and I... And, and, there was a lot of interesting stuff. So we're going to start in Matthew 8, 5 through 13. And I'll read Matthew's account of the centurion. And so it is. it says, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, Go, and he goes. And to another, Come, and he comes. And to my servant, Do this, and he does this. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Now turn over to Luke 7, 1 through 10. And so here it says, Now when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed, for I also am a man 
placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does that. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well, who had been sick. And so this is, to me, this is an interesting story, because you have a Roman who is a Gentile, by, not, by nature of not being a Jew, he's a Gentile, and so he would be looked down upon by the Jews, hated, despised, and, uh, but in every other sense of the word, if you took this man and you looked at him from the Roman perspective, this was a man of honor, this was a, a man of authority, I mean, so I, and I researched Centurion, and every, every mention of, of, of a Centurion came with rank. Centurions were men of high rank, you know, just, they, were, they referred to them as the backbone of the Roman army. These men, can, you, you know, were in charge of a hundred or so men, hence a Centurion, 100, and... Just a man accustomed to authority. He was the next step below, you know, the officers. So very, very high-ranking, very um, given to proud. These were men that were trusted. They, you know, in most, in, in Roman and most political theaters, you could buy your place in in the army, you know, in the officership or in the governorship or something like that, your, your popularity. But you had to have the t t time put in, in the army, to get to that rank and have the experience and the, the ability to lead. Like, you didn't just get it because, hey, I want to be a centurion. And they'd be like, sure, here you go. Here's the money. No, like, that was one position you couldn't buy. And so it was, so for, from this perspective, you know, in this time, right, Jews were not allowed in the Gentile house. You, you know, it was unheard of for a Jew to go into a Gentile's house. And in Luke 7, it shows you just how much this man understood Jewish culture. You know, and, and it's, it's funny because if you remember back when we were talking about the judgment seat of earth and we were talking about how Pilate didn't give anything, any cares whatsoever about the Jewish culture, like he did what he wanted and that's all that mattered. This man is quite the opposite. He understood Jewish culture, so he, t you know, he stopped Jesus from violating his Jewishness, his, himself, and making himself unclean from coming into his house, and he's also honored the Jews by building a synagogue. So this man understands, and on a deeper level, you know, one could even assume that he believes it, you know, that he believes in, in, in the Messiah coming. He believes in who Jesus is. And then the other thing is, this man is no ordinary man. He cares for his servant. In Roman culture, a slave was worse than cattle. You know, you treated cattle better than you did slaves. They were a thing. They were a farm tool. You didn't care for them. Yet this man is going out of his way to seek healing and help for the slave. So this was a man uh, who, who loved, who cared. Not, not some average ordinary Roman. And Jesus meets him, and it's one of these instances where Jesus exclaims, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. He says it to a Gentile. And Jesus has been around the block, and he's saying, this guy's got faith. You know, and, 
And Jesus test and, and, and in this, you know, we're going to look at these, we're going to go through the other two, and then I'm just going to kind of look at all of them together and see, and see just how similar they are and how Jesus acts. So the next one we're going to go to is Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Then Jesus, sent, Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. Now, I'm not going to read Mark. I just gave you that one because it's also covered in there. But it's it's an actual very similar passage. But here we see yet another Gentile, not a Jew. We see a woman, second class citizen, coming to Jesus, asking for healing for her daughter. And I, and you see the, the power and the strength of a mother under duress, you know, in this passage. At her wits, I mean, you can only imagine she's at her wits end, not knowing what to do with this daughter. She's probably, this isn't the first time the daughter, you know, has, has demonstrated the demon possession, but, and she's probably tried it, going to synagogues, going to other things, to get her daughter the healing. At her wits end, she hears about Jesus. And so she travels to go get Jesus, and talk to him, and try and reach him. And when she first calls out, he doesn't even acknowledge her. And then the disciples are just like, instead, these are the ones, the disciples are the ones that are supposed to be taking the reins from Jesus, and showing the love of Christ to the world after Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, can you just shut her up and send her away? And instead of answering her and giving her what she wants, he says, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so instead of turning around, she came and worshipped him. Lord, help me. And then I was doing, I was reading some William Barclay on this one, and it's interesting here. So Jesus insults her. By calling her a little dog. Now, William Barclay did say that there was a difference in... He didn't... In, in, in a sense, he didn't harshly insult her. Because if, if he wanted to harshly insult her, he would have called her, you know, whatever the Greek was for the, the dog's that would eat the rubbish and, and, and were mangy, disease-filled things. Here he calls her, you know, in the Greek is what he said is the little dogs, which are the pet dogs. You know, so he makes that difference. He doesn't call her trash and garbage and rubbish and really, really insult her, but he does, in a sense, put her in the place of where a Jew would normally put her in their place. And then... I, I love this. This is like, I, for me, this is one of the funny, the, a great example of the boldness that we can have when we come to Jesus, you know, and, and it's right here. And she says, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. You know, somebody who was less desperate, less persistent, who didn't know or believe who Jesus was, 
and what he could do would have left after that insult of being called a little dog. But here she is, and in boldness she quips back to him. And Jesus says, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And so now we go to John 4, 46 through 54. And this is a passage that kind of started me down this. So it's a nobleman's son, a nobleman's son healed. So Jesus came to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus had said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So this is interesting. Again, Gentile, a nobleman, right? These guys are the rich guys, would have been a Roman in Roman power, might have even bought his, his status and just been hated, been hated and seen as, as a jerk as, and hated and, and ostracized in Jewish culture. He would have never been included. But here he is coming down, a nobleman coming down and seeking out Jesus, seeking out a Gentile carpenter And he asks Jesus, you know, sir, heal, come down before my child dies. Heal my son. And Jesus says, go your way, your son lives. And so, you know, I kind of, when I initially read this and when I initially heard it, it, it my friend painted this, this nobleman in a very nicer picture than I had when I read it. You know, I read it here and it said, you know, so the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. So here I believe, here I read it as this man, you know, believed that Jesus was, could heal him, you know, because he'd heard Jesus about Jesus the healer. But then, but, but to me, as I was reading it, he didn't really believe that Jesus was the Christ. Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was who he was proclaiming to be. And then we get to verse 53. And then it says, and he himself believed in his whole household. And so upon finally hearing that his son is going to live and is healed, now he fully believes that this man is who he says he is. You know, but, but as I was reading this, you know, I have to give this man props. You know, I have to give this guy credit because he asks for healing for his son, which is not out of the ordinary for Jesus, for somebody to come up and ask him, right? But Jesus then responds to him and says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. I mean, how, how would you feel if Jesus said that to you? You know, that's a slap in the face. And, and in all honesty, it's basically Jesus is telling him about the entire interaction that they're going to have. And it proves Jesus' words true, that he really didn't believe until he heard that his son was healed. He didn't believe who Jesus was until he saw and heard that his son lived. And so these are all the stories that I read. And... They all have a lot in common, right? 
each and every one of them, they were coming on behalf of somebody else. So they had the faith, and we've talked about this, right? Having faith for healing of other people. You know, we can, we can garner up all the persistence, all the desire, all the prayer for other people. And here is Jesus healing somebody miles and miles away. So that takes a level of faith to, be, to not bring that person with you and to just say, if I just talk to this man, my son, my daughter, my slave will be healed. That takes a lot of faith. Each and every one of these persons was tested. Their heart was tested. Jesus tests our hearts. But each and every one was tested. The centurion was tested, you know, because these guys said, hey, he is deserving. You know, and if you under, like, he understood because he sent Jews on his behalf so that he wouldn't sully Jesus, make him unclean. And then he sent his friends out to stop Jesus from even coming close to his dwelling so he wouldn't become unclean. Jesus was testing him as he's going, and he saw the man's heart and the man's faith that he understood the authority of, that Jesus carried. That goes beyond just a wise healer, a teacher. You don't get authority by just reading about something. It's given to you. And so he recognizes Jesus' authority given to him by heaven. And it, that's why the servant was healed. The Gentile woman, she was tested. How far are you willing to go? Are you willing to take an insult and still seek out help? The nobleman was basically told, you won't believe who me saying who I am until you see the healing. That's a slap in the face, especially for a nobleman. You know, somebody who is, you know, it would be synonymous with prideful. To humble himself, be desperate enough to accept that slap in the face and still ask for healing. And so I looked at all these, and I, and I put myself in each and every one of those positions, and I said, would I have honored Jesus enough to be worried about him sullying his name for me? You know, would I... Would I take insult for Jesus? Would I take insult after insult and slight? Would I humble myself for Jesus, for healing when I come to ask him for it? You know, and, and I have to check my prayers when I come before Jesus. You know, because he's checking my heart. He's the same today as he was yesterday. So if he's going to check theirs, how much more mine? You know, if I call myself his son. So he tested every single one of their faith. Now, you know, to us it was like, oh, it's just words. It's just words. That's not really a hard testing. But <laughs> how many times do you fail even the lightest testing? You know, how, how does your faith, can your faith, Hold up. You know, these, these three, two of the three, were remarked as having great faith. Great faith. For, one, for understanding the authority of God. And two, for being persistent in the face of insult. 
worshiping Him, knowing who He is. But can our faith, can my faith survive time? Can my faith survive the distance of proximity? The distance of relationship with Jesus? You know, if you look at the woman, right, we saw Jesus didn't even answer her. He didn't even acknowledge her. Can our faith, can our request for, from Jesus handle him being silent for a little bit? Is it strong enough to handle his silence? I can tell you from personal experience, no. <laughs> there are times where my faith, I go and I say, Lord, I need this. 30 seconds goes by. Why haven't you given me this? And there's still nothing. And, and, and it, then it, it just, you know, makes me question, well, do you even love me, Jesus? I asked you 30 seconds ago and you didn't let me win the lottery. Do you even love me? You know, for my children, no matter where they are on this planet, I will love them. They don't have to be under my roof. They go to school. I don't stop loving them. They'll go to their grandparents. I won't stop loving them. They travel to the other side of the world. I won't stop loving them. The same is with Jesus. But if we feel like Jesus has distanced himself from us, does our faith last? Does our faith stay as strong as when we're in the presence of the Lord? Can it last? Can you still, I mean, when you are in the presence of the Lord, there is just a peace and a confidence that is just roaring through you like, like blood. But when that presence is gone, when that overwhelming presence is gone, can your faith still move mountains like it could with the presence of the Lord in there? Can it handle the distance of a relationship? Does your faith wane when you're not in the Word? When you're not in constant prayer, in constant worship? Does your relationship wane and dissipate with, with that? And it's only by my faith only stands because I'm in the Word. You know, we look at these guys, the centurion, the Gentile woman, the nobleman, and we can measure their faith in miles. We can measure their faith in miles. You know, and I, and I said this, and I said this because, and, and that when I was looking at the nobleman's, nobleman and his son, that just, like, I kind of looked at him and was like, you know, Jesus didn't even compliment your faith, you know, as being a great faith, you know, so what's so special about you? And the end result is that very last line in verse 53, and it says, he himself believed and his whole household. That's what's special about that man. He believed with all his heart and he led his household to believing him in who Jesus was. Their faith is measured in miles. How can we measure our faith? Centimeters, meters, kilometers, you know, whatever metric system or <laughs> 
system, can you measure it? Can you measure your faith? And, and, and the honest truth is, sometimes you can with me. You know, the Lord can measure my faith in the distance. And sometimes, you know, sometimes my faith goes as far as the east is from the west. I can believe and have faith in the Lord for as long as I need to in certain areas. In other areas, it's about as far as I can throw my 95-pound dog, which I wouldn't do, buddy. But the point still remains. And in order to be the Christian that the Lord has called us, we have to be a well-rounded Christian. You know, I can't be a super rock star in one and deficient in another. You know, I can't love family but not love somebody else. You know, that's not what he calls us to love everyone. He, you know, so you can't, and, and that's, that's the point of being a Christian is sitting back, looking at yourself and going, how can I be more Christ-like? Where am I deficient, Lord? Show me how I can get better, how I can trust you more. And that comes with testing. It comes with testing. And, you know, the funny thing is, is when that testing comes, we look at it and it's like God asking us to separate the Red Sea. When in reality, all he is is giving us a little verbal reprimand, a little slap on the wrist. But our faith takes a hit. You know, so at the end of these, you look and they were persistent. They believed. They worshipped. They recognized Jesus' authority. And they changed. And they changed. You know, the nobleman had to wait another day. He traveled. He had to wait until the next day to even get word that his, he, that his son was healed. He didn't know right away. It wasn't he picked up his phone. It was no carrier pigeon that flew into his hand and said, hey, your son's healed. No, he had to wait until he ran into somebody from his household to tell him that his son was healed. Can your faith survive that day? That when you hear the promise of the Lord and he says, go, son, go, daughter, it is as you requested. But we have to wait for it to come. Does our faith, is our faith strong enough to withstand that distance, that time, for it to manifest? Does it? Can it? You know, one of the interesting things that I read in this, and I believe it, it was in that Matthew uh, 8 section. I'm looking here, making sure. Yeah. So in the Matthew 8, 5 through 15, the section, you know, so, so Jesus is just complimenting and marveling. You know, Jesus heard it and he marveled. Jesus marveled. Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. But this was interesting. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into utter dark, outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
And so here it's saying, Jesus is recognizing Gentile faith, the, the outreaching of the gospel. Because the Jews are the sons of the kingdom. And they will be cast out into utter darkness because they don't have the faith, they don't have the belief in Jesus Christ and who he is. You know, the Jews, according to William Barclay when I read him, you know, the Jews expect that just because they are Jews, they will be in the kingdom of heaven just because they are Jews. And Jesus is saying right here, the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into utter darkness. That's not true. And so that, that should be a warning to us that just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't make you one. You know, there... If you are not bearing the fruit of, the, of, of a heart changed by Jesus, are you a Christian? You know, and that, and it goes beyond, and it separates itself from just being a good person. But I think we have a lot to learn, and a lot to, to look at ourselves in, in these, this faith. You know, we, can it survive? Can our faith survive the distance? Or would we need to bring it before Jesus and see it manifest immediately? Can our faith in Jesus, in God, in the Holy Spirit, and their power survive a little time, a little silence, a little distance, or I should say feeling of distance, because they promise to never leave us nor forsake us. But can it survive that feeling? Can it? And not only that, can it survive a testing? You know, the Lord promises that our road is going to be tough. But can we survive the testing with the faith that we have? You know, Jesus didn't even test these guys very hard. All he did was ignore her and say, you're like a little pet at a table. I'm giving the food to the, the good food to the kids. You know, in all sense of the word, that for us, that's not that hard a testing, not that harsh a criticism. But will we stand in there and accept it and have the courage to, to respond? How far does our faith go? Can we measure it in miles or inches? Can we measure our faith in days, years? Or is it only a matter of seconds? So that's the question I pose to you. How far does your faith go? Lord, we just give honor to you because even when we have no faith, you are still faithful. And the promises you have made are the promises you keep.
And Lord, the, the revelations that you've given tonight, I just ask that you write them on our hearts, write them on our tongues, that when we come before you, that you will be able to say to the angels around you, look at this one and look at their faith and how great it is. And I thank you, Lord, for loving me even when I don't have such great faith. In all honor and glory to your name and the name above all names. In Jesus' name, amen.